Korean and other languages. Dr. Glub's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies, ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his research background as a behavioral scientist with over 15 years in academia. That includes seven as a professor at Ohio State University, where he wrote dozens of peer-reviewed articles. In his free time, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. Um, you can laugh at that. Um, to help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us about returning to the office and managing hybrid and remote teams. Excellent. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Lana. Let's talk about this topic for you as association professionals. So how can you best figure out the return to the office, managing of hybrid and remote teams, the future of work? And that's both internally for your association, but also for helping your members figure this same stuff out. Looking at the chat, there are a number of people here who have members, for example, the Turnaround Management Association, the Florida Senior Living Association, the Society of CPAs, you know, these are all folks who are also trying to figure this out and they will turn to you for guidance and you need to help guide them in this issue. So it's both for you and for your members. This is the information that we'll provide. Now, the first part of the presentation will focus on the research. So as you've heard from this, uh, back from this, my background, I'm an academically informed expert, meaning very evidence-based looking at the research and using that rather than personal experience and so on. But there's certainly personal experience. I helped 16 organizations, including associations, adapt to the future, the hybrid, what people are calling hybrid future, or hybrid future, with some people doing remote only. So I know how it works in the real world, including within associations, as well as within a number of large companies. So my last client was a Fortune 200 tech company. And now my new client is a 400 people research institute. And I had a couple of associations as well. So I know that real world experience and I'll be speaking from that as well. And that will be more of the second part of the presentation, which talks about the pragmatic aspects of how do you effectively lead hybrid and remote teams? How do you manage them? So that's the structure of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. All right, now let's talk a little bit about how leaders generally perceive hybrid and remote work. And it's not necessarily about you, but there are some leaders who do say that people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. And you know what? That's an accurate statement in terms of the future. People are our greatest resource because you, know, you can compete away your structure, your systems, your processes, but your people and your culture, which is ingrained in the people, that's your greatest resource, that's your differentiator. But that is something that many leaders aren't living up to. They aren't really living up to that principle. And that's especially important for you as association leaders because you're modeling these principles to your association members. You know, the way that you act is the way that your association members will learn to act. So you're kind of being a role model. And you need to live up to that principle and help them live up to that principle. Unfortunately, very many folks who are leaders, they are experienced, they're comfortable, they like in-office culture. So they want to go back to the office, even if that sometimes goes against their organizational true objectives. They're trying to turn back the clock to go back to January 2020 without truly recognizing that that time is behind us and it's not really ever going to come back that world of January 2020 the pandemic has fundamentally shifted our values norms habits even before the delta surge it's pretty clear and the delta surge makes it especially clear that the virus is going to stay it's not going to stop being here covid will eventually transform from a pandemic into an endemic meaning it will stay around and still get people sick and this will still impact us, but in a lesser way. So COVID and who knows what will happen with other variants 
And it will be not simply the variants, it won't simply be COVID, but it will also be the issue of the challenges that we have with adapting to this world. And that's something that you want to really be thinking about. So I'm curious whether you've seen that in your members or in some leaders around you, that you ever observe leaders trying to turn back the clock. Is that something you've observed? Oh, something is wrong with this poll. Anyway, the top half uh, should be turning back the clock, bottom half should be not turning back the clock. I think there was an issue with the way it was put in. So is that something that you've observed? All right, so we clearly see that some people observed it and some people didn't, So, but a significant proportion of you did observe this issue. So good to know, and that's definitely something that we want to be thinking about, that this is definitely an issue for a number of folks. Okay, now let's talk about returning to full-time office work. Now this unfortunately is a serious, serious problem for many people. It's dangerously bad in a number of ways. In retaining your people and in your members retaining their people. So not in retaining your members, but in retaining your staff. And of course, for your members and retaining their staff, because we'll talk about, as we will talk about, many people do not want to go back to the office full time. Some people don't even want to go back to the office for, at all. And of course, recruiting. So recruiting staff is a big challenge when they're asked to come to a position that they don't want to be in. Morale is definitely hit seriously by efforts to return to the office, force people to return to the office full time. Productivity is definitely lowered by that if people are forced to return to the office full time. Work life balance is seriously undermined. And mental health and well being are also very much undermined by being forced to return to the office full time. So, the bottom line of your organizational mission, not simply your money, but your organizational mission to unite association members and serve them, is really seriously undermined by trying to force people to go back to the office full time. And you know what, we see that leaders are making these bad decisions in even the largest companies. For example, Google was saying for many, many months that it'll get its workers back to the office, back to the office, back to the office once vaccines are available. And once vaccines are available by that time, Google's workers learn that they can be, do their job just fine in their home offices and many did not want to return. And so once Google started forcing people to return, it or saying that it's going to force people to return to a certain date, then people started protesting internally from my internal source of Google, resigning, quitting, leaving, and morale took a serious hit, productivity took a hit. And eventually on May 5th, Google was forced to revise its plan, said, okay, we screwed up. Now, instead of having people go back to their previous offices, we'll have up to 20% of our workforce be fully remote and another 20% work from whatever Google office they want. So if they moved away from their office, they don't have to work at that same office. And so that is Google. And of course, they lost many billions of dollars in that. It's a, many, it's a trillion dollar company. And they lost a lot of talented workers who are replacing them will take billions. And of course, they also lost morale and productivity. That's going to serious hit to their bottom line. And then their plans had to be changed. And that's a huge, huge loss. So that's Google. Interestingly, the same thing was happening at Amazon. Of course, it's headquarters, not the workers on the ground floor, the essential workers, but the headquarters. And Amazon had to make that same turnaround on June 10th. And then Uber had to make that same turnaround on June 24th. And this is all before the Delta surge. So if even before the Delta surge, large, huge companies were running into this buzzsaw of making bad decisions by the leadership and having to reverse them. And the way that you can see that the leadership made bad decisions, it cost them a lot of money, is that they had to publicly embarrass themselves and come out and change their policies. So this is something you don't want to fall into yourself. And this is something you don't want to let your members fall into, these dangerous traps. Now, while, just so that you know, while I'm talking, you can put in your questions into the chat as you have them and I'll answer them at the end of the presentation. I usually don't take questions throughout the presentation because I find I often answer them during the presentation. But you can put your questions in so you don't forget them. Now, let's talk about the data, the data on what 
employees want after the pandemic. And this is based on eight major surveys by large organizations, including associations like the Society for Human Resource Management by large universities, such as, like, such as the Harvard Business School. So they don't have a stake in whatever the outcome will be. They just want accurate information and they're very credible. So what did these surveys find? They found that over 85% of the workers want substantial remote time. That means over half their schedule they want, they want at home and some full time at home. So only about 15%, depending on the survey, 10 to 20% want their, want to be back in the office full time. So yeah, and that's pretty indicative of what the internal surveys were at the clients that I serve. So for, I think the largest amount of workers that wanted to be back full time was at a high tech, was at that high tech manufacturing company that I mentioned, the Fortune 200 company. They had something like 25% of the workers who could work from home want to go back full time in the office, but that's kind of because it's a culture of manufacturing, right? You have some essential employees who have to be in the workplace. The, my newest client, the Research Institute, 8% of the people there want to be back in the office full time. Over 25% of all, 25 to 35%, depending on the survey, want full-time remote work. So full-time remote work. And then over 40%, 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. And of course, lots of people over 70% would be less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. Now, you've probably heard of the great resignation with huge amounts of people resigning right now. And there is just a Harvard Business Review article just came out looking at the causes. And of course, people wanting a more flexible schedule, meaning remote work, substantial remote work, is a huge, huge cause of the great resignation, where people know that they can do their work from home and they hate the commute and they want to be back and they want to be at home for most or all of their work. And so this is a huge issue, the retention and recruitment angle. Now, another angle that's not so much talked about, but I think is really important for us to talk about is diversity inclusion, is the diversity, equity, inclusion angle, the DEI. Now, there was a survey done as part of this, these surveys. It found that 20% of white knowledge workers want full-time in office work. And of course, white knowledge workers are the tend to be the kind of workers that are members of association, whether CPAs or their turnaround management, retirement professionals, so of the retired senior living professionals, 20% of white knowledge workers want full-time in-office work. What about non-white knowledge workers, black knowledge workers, for example? How many of them want full-time office work? Only 3%. Only 3% want full-time in-office work. Why is that? Well, because of the microaggressions and the discrimination that they still suffer in the office. And they suffer much less of that in virtual settings, although there is still some of these microaggressions and problematic expressions toward them. So this is a big, big issue. This is a serious issue. And of course, this applies to other minorities as well. So you have similar findings, especially for people with various physical disabilities. They want more so like, ideally they would want full-time remote work. So this is something that's really important to think about in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, that more remote work, that uh, hybrid mostly hybrid schedules or fully remote work are conducive to DEI, whereas getting people to spend more time in the office goes against diversity, equity, inclusion goals. So if you want to achieve diversity, equity, inclusion goals, you want to offer people more flexibility, more remote schedules. And the same thing goes for your members. So that's something to be thinking about. Another thing to think about is well being. So, this is an important question. Now, there's questions of Zoom burnout and all that, but we're finding that overwhelmingly work at home would really help people out. So, these surveys show that over 75% of the people would be happier, over 70% less stressed over 75% better able to manage work-life balance. And so it's very helpful for work-life balance, mental well-being, less stress. Now, what about productivity? Kind of the other angle here. Of course, on average, workers worked more 
per month rather than less. And you probably heard about this, but you might not have heard about the specific details. They work over 20 hours more. And why is that? Well, the top reason that people indicate that in surveys, and this is not, this is not coming from surveys, this is, the, this is coming both from survey research and observational evidence, as well as things like Microsoft Teams and Slack internal communication evaluation of when people are logging on time and doing things. So over 20 hours more per, per month because they're not doing commutes. You know, commute is an hour there, an hour back, you know, the hour, some time you spend driving, some time you spend putting on clothes, transitioning from one place to the other, going through security. So an hour there, an hour back, that's two hours spent each day on unpaid labor. So of course people are willing to work more time and they are more productive overall. We have seen that on surveys over 75% report higher or equal productivity and employees would take an average of 8% pay cut for substantial remote work, ranging from zero to those who want full-time work in the office as I, that I mentioned, to ranging into the 20 to 30% for people who want full-time remote work. So this is really important to people. Now, there are some challenges with remote work. Over 50% feel overworked. Over 55% experience burnout and over 80% want less meetings. There are also some serious issues in terms of poor virtual communication skills. Over 60% of people report that and over 55% of the people report technology issues being serious problems. So these are easily fixable issues, but this is something about setting boundaries, whether people feel overworked, they feel pressured by their supervisors to be on beyond work hours. And that's why they experience burnout as well. And they have too many meetings. So there's definitely ways of reducing that that aren't very difficult. And of course, there's ways of training people to have better virtual communication skills and to address technology issues. So these are solvable problems. It just takes a little bit of effort to solve them. Now let's do a poll. After the pandemic, uh, again, the B should be one day at home. Uh, so after the pandemic has passed, which of these would be your preferred working styles? Fully remote, one day in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full time, five days in the office? Please go ahead and vote. Let's give you five more seconds. All right. So we see pretty clearly that the hybrid schedule would be the winner. And this generally falls in line with the results that we see where 17% you know, want the, to be fully remote. Of the, a third want one day in the office, two th another third wants two days in the office, and then another 17% want three days in the office. So pretty clearly that there's no, nobody wants full-time five days in the office. Good to see that. Now, what are the reasons some people make mistakes around coming to the office? So this is some of the research on the reasoning on how people make mistakes around hybrid and remote teams. Whether it's coming to the office, whether it's running them, a big, big problem is called the status quo bias. So this is a cognitive bias. Now, cognitive biases, you've heard from Lana talking about my background in behavioral science. Cognitive biases are the dangerous judgment errors that we make because of how our brain is wired. Now, where are they coming from? Why are we making these errors, right? Shouldn't have we have had evolved these errors out? Well, actually, they're coming from our evolutionary background because our civilization has been around for a very short time. Our evolu we have not evolved for the modern environment. You know, think about the modern environment with the internet around, it's been since the 1990s, right? So we're not used to the modern environment at all. Our evolutionary background is conducive to the ancient savanna environment. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, we did not have a virtual communication back then. We, were, we are very tribal creatures. We want to be in a small circle of people around us and we want to make decisions that aren't formed by that savanna environment. So it's very intuitive for us to make bad decisions. And these bad decisions you know, that come from the fight or flight reflex, the, the come from the for tribalism and other aspects of the savanna environment, 
are called cognitive biases, the ways that our mind goes awry, the ways that we make serious mistakes. The status quo bias is one of these cognitive biases. Now, what's the status quo bias? It's our desire to maintain or get back to the status quo, the one that we feel is right and correct. Now, in the savannah environment, that's understandable why we had that status quo bias. If our lives were very precarious, the lives of our ancestors, if the situation changed, it was generally a bad thing. So there's a strong internal motivator, a drive to get back to the previous situation, to address the problem. In the savannah environment, that was evolutionarily beneficial for survival. In the modern environment, our world is changing pretty quickly and there are many major disruptions whether they're caused by technology and you know, the rise of the smartphone, right? Whether it's caused by financial situations like the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis, or it's caused by biological such things like the pandemic and then accompanying virtual technology. So with facilitating high, fully remote work or hybrid work. So this is, there's a desire in us to get back to what we perceive as the status quo and leaders perceive the status quo very often as being something that they have successfully led before the rise of the internet. I mean, they've been successful for 20, 30 years in the office, through leading in the office, through having that sense of authority, sense of control, sense of engagement, sense of social surroundings, they're comfortable with it. So many leaders who are experienced senior are very comfortable with it, and they want to get back to that and they're blind to the major disruption caused by the pandemic. Now, another big problem is called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect. What's that about? Well, we have a belief that others who are in our tribe share our preference. That's so tribalism, right? The tribalist aspect of the cognitive biases. In the Savannah environment, it was generally a safe belief that others in our tribe shared our values, our preferences, our beliefs. In the modern environment, not so much, because people are very different from us in many, many ways. But leaders tend to feel that others share their beliefs and preferences. Now, I'll give you an, the example coming from the, that I gave on Amazon, on Google, on Uber. The leaders at the top had a false belief that their employees would overall share their preferences for getting back to the office full time. And they did not investigate the situation nearly well enough to figure out. I mean, they could have done a much better job rather than publicly embarrassing themselves, losing great talent, having a serious morale and productivity hit, and losing billions of dollars and having to change their plans. They could have done a much better job of figuring out what their employees wanted before announcing, OK, here's going to be the policy. But they didn't. And that's a mistake that people at the very top companies make, and of course, throughout the economy make. So this is a serious issue that you want to address. And that is very important. And you want to help your members address. Another one is called the confirmation bias. The confirmation bias. We tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. In the Savannah environment, it was quite important to make decisions pretty quickly. That was the fight or flight response. We had to jump at a hundred shadows to get away from that one saber to tiger. We are the descendants of those who had a very strong fight or flight response. So we had to very quickly look for information and it was fine to take very huge shortcuts and motivate ourselves into action. But the confirmation bias is very bad in the modern environment. I'll give you another example. So when I worked with a large organization of peer executive groups around the world. So it's around the world, peer executive groups, large organization, and it had many thousands of executives from middle market companies and organizations, including associations, as part of its membership. And so I was working with them on a survey and they surveyed their executives who are members of this association, who, who are members of this large, or group, large organization, and they asked these executives, did you do a survey to find out whether your employees and how your employees want to work after the pandemic? And this was a survey that they did in, I think, April of this year. So pretty clear that you really need to know what's going on. And only 44% 
of executives surveyed their employees, only 44%. That I found very, very sad and very distressing and disturbing. Of course, it's very bad that they're looking for information that confirms their beliefs and ignoring information that doesn't. What tended to happen for the people who didn't is that the CEO or the executive director would talk to the senior VPs and the senior VPs would talk to their, would talk to their VPs and that's all, <laughs> didn't go beyond that. And they would all agree with each other that they should go back to the office and that's what happened. It's a big problem. So they were ignoring the hard data on the damage from being forced to in, do in-office work. Another serious mental blind spot is called the normalcy bias, the normalcy bias. We underestimate the likelihood and impact of major disruptors, whether it's the pandemic itself or the Delta variant. Now, if you remember way back in that very lovely time of, of late June, early July, when Delta, did not seem to be a big issue. I was already, I'm, I mean, I'm an expert in this stuff, so I was predicting that Delta would be a serious issue, but generally speaking, people were not talking about it and weren't really thinking about it. Even when it was becoming clear to me and to others who are looking at the future and making good decisions, that the Delta surge would be a very serious problem. And people were not thinking about it and they were think, planning to go back to the office in September, some, uh, still are and some have already forced their employees to go back to the office and many of these employees have resigned. So the threat of new variants is something that people aren't really considering. The long tail risk of variants. It's not simply the Delta surge. Now Delta surge is a serious problem, which is why the Biden administration has approved the boosters. So Pfizer effectiveness versus Delta is down to 39% after six months. So this is a big problem. But there's other variants that are coming down the road, like the Delta Plus variant. It's more resistant to vaccines, but just as infectious as Delta. It's spreading in the Bay Area and 11 countries. And so this is a big, big problem. And there are other variants that you've probably heard about. The new variant, the Lambda variant, the, the Beta variant that might be serious, serious problems down the road. So we'll continue to face them going forward. That means that we can't simply plan for, okay, the Delta surge will end in January and we'll just come back to the office then. We need to plan for what will happen with new variants. So your risk management and company culture for your association itself and for your associate, so the staff at your association and the members of your associations needs to think about this sort of stuff. It's beneficial to have a minority of your team members be fully virtual, to have systems and processes that enable everyone to go fully virtual on short notice. So if I was in a state where Delta surge was a serious issue, so Texas, Florida, others, that of course you're in Florida, it's so fortunately dying down, decreasing right now, but that is something to be thinking about where, where and I know not everyone is in Florida, so one person in New York, New York is not such an issue, but Florida where most of you are, that is still a pretty serious issue. So you want to be able to have everyone go fully virtual when it's spreading highly in your area. So that's be something to be thinking about. Another one is called functional fixedness. This is the last one I want to talk about that's very serious. Now, what's going on with functional fixedness? You might have heard of this as the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you learn one way of collaborating, one way of functioning, one way of communicating, that tends to be the way that you stick to. You perceive that as the right way to function. So the right way to work, the right way to collaborate. And you tend to impose that hammer on all the nails that you see, even though it might not be a nail, it might be a bolt, and you really should be using a wrench to address that problem. So what happened in March 2020? Well, the major lockdowns, what people, uh, companies all over overwhelmingly did was transpose their in-office culture on remote work. So transposing that in-office culture and remote work, that unfortunately does not work very well. They fail to adapt strategically to remote work. So for example, things like Zoom happy hours are not a good way of functioning. Zoom happy hours have not been shown by research to be productive. They've been shown to be counterproductive. They've actually harm engagement. And there's a reason that so many people want less meetings. This is a big, big problem. At Zoom happy hours, team meetings, weekly meetings have also been problematic in the way that they are currently done and the way they're, they're currently structured. Because people are bored, they're disengaged, and 
of the leaders are trying to engage their members through weekly team meetings. But that is a problematic and not very helpful way of engaging members based on the research on this topic, because they're just trying to transpose in office culture what they're comfortable and familiar with on virtual settings that doesn't work well, unfortunately. All right, so let's do another little poll. Which of these cognitive biases might be most problematic for the return to the office in your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. Which of these cognitive biases might be most problematic? Let's give you five more seconds. All right, so we see that the status quo bias and the false consensus effect oh, kind of went out. These are both very serious issues. So two thirds of you, and of course the confirmation bias, functional fixedness are lesser issues, but still an issue. Good to see that, that you are aware of which of these are serious issues now that we talked about them and you can bring back this information to your office and share about this. And of course, share about this with your members as well. And you'll get some resources at the end of the presentation to enable you to share about this with your members as well as with fellow staff. Now, what is going to be the competitive advantage in the future of work for your association staff and for your members and for their companies that they are in? It's going to be a team-led hybrid first model with a minority full remote. Overwhelmingly, this for, the, for all associations, I would say that this would be the right way to go for the companies and organizations that I run for the three associations I helped, they chose this model. And for the 13 other companies, 13 other organizations of them, uh, the 12 chose a hybrid first model and one chose what they're calling a home centric model, meaning that it's mostly remote and people are just coming into the office when they need to do a certain task or meet. So that's going to be the right strategy for the large majority of organizations. You want to have a minority of people, 10 to 30% fully remote, and then a majority should be hybrid, doing one to three days in the office. The amount of in-office work should depend on collaboration. How do you know how much time people should be spending in the office? One day a week is a good default. So for that's fine for team collaboration, cohesion for culture, engagement, but anything over that should be based on, the, on collaboration. And so you need to make sure that if people want their teams to be spending more time in the office, that that's going to be decided based on the amount of collaboration they do. And it should be a team-led hybrid model, meaning that you want to let the supervisors of the rank and file teams make the decision. Give them these broad guidelines and tell them that they should be making the decisions for their members. Of course, in consultation with the team members, they should make the decision on what their team is going to do and coordinate if they, let's say, are coming in one day a week, then they should coordinate on which day everyone comes in. And uh, But they should make the amount of in-office work should be based on collaboration and they, they're, therefore they should justify any time because they'll still, some of them I, from experience, they're still going to fall into these cognitive biases. They're still gonna have that status quo bias and false confirmation bias causing them to really want to go back to the office even though that's a really bad idea and they will lose team members. Uh, people will leave in this great resignation and they will find hard to recruit people. And of course, engagement and productivity will also take a hit. Now, who should have fully remote options? About 10 to 30%, I often guess that, get asked that. It's teams that decide to be fully remote. So if there's a team and it decides that we want to be fully remote, of course, they should be fully remote. For individuals and hybrid teams, that's the tricky question. If someone on a hybrid team wants to be fully remote, so the team, let's say, decided that they want to come back to the office one day a week, but somebody on the team says, I really, really, really want to be fully remote. What happens then? Well, you want to make sure that if you allow them to be fully remote, that they can be effective while working fully remotely. And that should be based on their demonstration of remote effectiveness during the pandemic, their productivity, their communication, their engagement. So are they doing that? 
Also, they should be made aware of potential career growth issues because if everyone is coming in and you're not, it's really easy to be left behind when various projects that are more challenging or difficult and conducive to career growth are assigned to people. So people can, should be trained on how to be advocates for themselves if they are going to be fully remote within the organization and ask for what they need and search out various opportunities for career growth because the natural thing that will happen is that they will be left behind if this is not addressed. Now, even for people who are fully remote, you want team building retreats once per quarter to improve social bonds and trust and plan team strategy going forward. As part of the process of changing up the into a hybrid first model with some people fully remote, you want to reshape your office space. You will not need as much office space. So you wanna get info from team leaders and their plans for an office work. So let's say some people are gonna come in two days a week. Some people are gonna come, most people are gonna come in one day a week. Some people will be fully remote. So you'll have an average of one day a week. You wanna make sure to distribute them throughout the week so that not everyone comes in on a Monday or a Wednesday. And you want to decrease your real estate and office services accordingly. So that's a great savings. And that's definitely something that the companies and organizations, associations that I worked with found very beneficial. You know, you need about 20% of your real estate for things like accounting, for the pay, not the accounting, but the payroll things and for offices, for supervisors. And the rest of it is based on occupancy. So if you have 100% occupancy before the pandemic, but now you only have people coming in on an average of one day a week, so only 20% occupancy, well, you can get rid of over 50% of your real estate. And companies and associations have done that, of, or some are going to do that after their lease is over, or some are finding it's a better, good idea to break a long-term lease, and depending on their financial situation, and they are getting rid of that real estate. And then you want to reshape the office space to be mostly collaborative, mostly collaborative. That means changing your office space from individual cubicle office arrangements, which is generally was before the pandemic, it's 20% collaborative, 80% private is the general tendency for various, for the typical office setup. Now it should be something like one third private, two thirds collaborative. And the one third private should be for generally for leadership offices, or if there's, I mean, I don't imagine that your associations need to do any work in secret, but some of the companies like Northrop Grumman that I worked with need to, to do some work that is going to be classified. So the, that private work. Now, the rest of the people, they, it should be a combination of hoteling and shared desk space. So floating desks, well, whatever, all of that sort of stuff, because they will not be doing their work in the office. So when you are find when you look at actual productivity numbers collaborative work can be better done well it depends some is better done in the office some is better done at home it also depends on the people and the team and the how they function together so collaborative work is kind of a wash a balance but individual tasks are way better done at home people are 20 to 30 percent more productive in individual tasks at home which makes sense they're not nearly as interrupted they have a much more comfortable environment so this is something that you need to realize and communicate to people, to your staff members and to your association members that you do not need that workspace. I mean, people are certainly like to keep their cubicles and offices, but that's not something that they'll really need. They will not be doing that individual work in the office. They'll be coming in you know, on a Thursday to have a team meeting in the morning and then have a meeting with their team leader and then have some you know, have a meeting with a, some, a collaborator with whom they need to do collaborate on some tasks from their team. And then they'll go home. <laughs> and so that is going to be the way that their day looks like and they'll be doing their work at home. Now they can take their laptop with them and plug it in or hotel and you know check their email at work. But generally that's not going to happen too much. People really generally prefer to do their work at home. Now, if there's of course space between meetings, they will be doing that. So that's the shared desks. As part of this, you want to be thinking about a distributed office. So your office of your association and of your association's members is going to be mostly in the homes of your 
team members of your employees. So you want to fund that home office. You'll save a lot on real estate, and you'll also save on office-based services and products. You know, you have a budget for each person who's in the office. So you want to use that money, use those savings to fund home offices. So whether it's providing them with lots of varied equipment and also a stipend for various other needs that they have, or a stipend, it depends on the organization. You know, the new organization that I'm working with is a research institute that's part of a large university. So they just have a supplier who provides a lot of technology to them that they can order, and they are can they are going to start providing a set of the standard technology to their team members. Why is that a set? Well, it's you know, you know, if your team members have to work hard and ask for exceptions to get various things that they need, they're not going to do it. And especially for things that are not for their needs, but for their team members' needs. I'll explain. So the laptop they need for their own needs, right? For they, they need a good laptop. But some people won't even do that because they're like, whatever, this is the work laptop. And they really need a better laptop if they're going to bring it to the office, to work, to home, definitely need a high quality laptop. But it's not simply the laptop. What about their microphones? What about their cameras? What about their lighting? All of those things, they're not a bother to them. <laughs> they're not a hindrance to them. They're a hindrance to their team members and they're a hindrance to their clients. Now, I know that there is one person here from a CPA in New York City, the New York CPA Society, another from Florida Turnaround Management Association. And guess what? The clients of your organizations are going to not be as engaged. And whether you're making a sale or you're providing client service, they are not going to do very well if you don't have a great camera, if you don't have a great microphone and great lighting. But people don't realize that. Your staff members don't realize that. And even if they realize that, they expect you to take care of it, not you, the association members, but the, the members of your associations. So they expect the leaders of the companies to take care of that. So you need to provide these things to them as standard. And other things like room separators, of course, paying for good internet connection and ergonomic furniture so that are comfortable because comfort results in productivity, soundproofing so they're not distracted, room separators, as I mentioned already, all of those things need to be provided to people for them to be productive, comfortable, and effective in their communication and collaboration. Now, I'm going to do a poll right now on whether you think you or any members of your team would benefit from such funding. Please go ahead and vote on that. Five more seconds. Okay, so clearly we see that it would definitely be a benefit literally to everyone. Great. Now, let's talk about how to lead hybrid teams. So we talk about shape, office space. We talked about the structure of the teams, what it should look like, high remote, the, the conditions, the environment, funding for office, home offices, what the, what the in-office space looks like. What about other things. How do you measure them? How do you evaluate them? Well, you need to revise your performance evaluation. Performance evaluation tends to be based on the amount of time worked and a big annual performance evaluation. That needs to be drastically shifted. Of course, people, you can't see them work virtually in hybrid settings, especially if some people are fully remote. That is not the, that should not be the future going forward. You want to focus not on time spent working, but on deliverables. How productive are they? On their individual tasks, on their collaborative tasks. And you want to do that not in a big annual performance evaluation because you're, now you're measuring deliverables. Those can be measured very regularly and effectively and people can know what they're doing well and what they're not doing well on a regular basis and you can improve them. So this should be fundamentally changed. So instead of having that one big annual or quarterly performance evaluation, you need to do much smaller weekly performance evaluations and in a meeting, in a check-in meeting. So what happens is that 48 hours before a meeting, a team member sends your report. So if you're the leader, team member sends the report to the leader, on to the team leader saying, hey, here are my top three to five accomplishments for the week. 
here are the problems that I faced with those accomplishments. Here's how I solved these problems or what I'm doing to solve these problems. Here are my top three to five accomplishments that I plan to work on next week. And here's a self-evaluation I would give myself for the week. And you can have a scale from one to five or something like that. So then the team leader responds to that in a meeting. And there's a meeting, a 15 to 30 minute meeting where there's a check-in on how the employee is doing, their activities, their productivity, just their work-life balance, and then discussion of the report. We're talking about the how the employee solved the problems, maybe giving them some coaching on how to solve the problems better, agreeing or revising their intended accomplishments for next week, and then agreeing or revising their self-evaluation. And that all gets fed into a continuous promotion and evaluation system. That is the future. That's the future of what is going to be the hybrid and remote team management. So that is how you need to manage the teams. You need to measure what you want managed, the actual productivity, actual collaborative activities of, and individual tasks, their accomplishments there. And you need to give them feedback. You need to measure it and give them feedback every week and that takes care of so many headaches and so many problems and so many hassles. I have managers coming to me and saying they're spending way less time on communicating with their team members since the team member knows that they will have that one meeting and where they can bring up issues, concerns, and talk about their performance. Team members are very happy because they know where they stand and what they need to do to correct their performance issues and what they need to do in order to be promoted. So good evaluations and so on. So this is really a very good tool for managing hybrid and remote teams going forward. Now, what are you thinking of this? Would you think it will be valuable for you to revise the, your performance evaluation, your organization's performance associate evaluation to aligned with this more hybrid remote work style. Let's give you five more seconds. We're definitely seeing very clearly that this is also pretty important and valuable. Good to hear that. So again, this is information on funding, on reshaping home offices, on performance evaluation that you should be bringing back to your organization. And of course, all of this is something you should be bringing to your association members as professional development for them. You also want to adapt your culture, shift your culture to replace office style bonding with native virtual formats. Like I said, Zoom happy hours, not a good way of effectively collaborating together, not a good, not a good technique. What you need to do instead is do things like a text-based morning update, which is kind of like a virtual water cooler. So let's say you have, I hope you have collaborative software like Microsoft Teams or Slack or Trello or Sana or Mondays. And each of those, you can set up a channel for each team, or if you're a small association for the whole association. So my team is a six people consulting and training firm, and we have that for the whole organization. But if you have, let's say, 40 people at your association, then you need to set up one for each six to eight people team. And so you want to set up a channel, for example, in Microsoft Slack for that's called private, it's called personal, and that should be for personal conversations for each team or for the whole organization if it's small. And in the morning, what you do is you have a morning update where everyone shares the first thing they do, kind of checking in as their daily check-in on how they're feeling that day, how their personal life is going, what an interesting fact about themselves or the world that other people don't know about, and then something, and then what they plan to focus on that day. And then they should respond to three other people's daily sharing. So their facts, their personal lives, and whatnot. That replaces the, the, the water cooler conversation or the, or the break room conversation, whatever happened back then. It addresses any the needs for Zoom happy hours, kind of the bonding that people have with team meetings as well, the, you know, the Monday team meeting, not a good structure. We could talk about that in the Q&A and why that is. 
So that is very helpful. And then they can continue throughout the day to chat on that channel. So you'll find that people who are more extroverted tend to chat more, people who are more introverted tend to chat less, although sometimes they do. But the crucial thing is that everyone has that morning check-in as their way of checking into work. And I find that that's actually really helpful to managers who are sometimes worried about whether their employees are working or not, you know, that they have a car accident, that they get COVID, what happened, are they in? So that's very helpful. So the text-based morning update is replaces Zoom happy hours and other team bonding activities. Another technique that helps teams bond, but in a more collaborative way, and also helps with on-the-job learning and mentoring is called digital co-working. Now, digital co-working is a structure where every day that you're not in the office, for, so for a hybrid team, every day that they're not coming into the office, so if you're coming into the office on Wednesday, it would be Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and for remote teams every day, you dial into a video conference call for one hour or so, two hours, depending on the team, but you want to start with an hour. And at the beginning of the video conference call, everyone shares what they're going to be working on during that hour. And this is for individual tasks, not collaborative tasks. They're not chatting with each other, not trying to do collaborative tasks together. This is for individual tasks. So what kind of individual tasks they plan to work on? And then they turn their microphones off and they leave their speakers on and their video is optional. So you want video, you can have video, you don't want video, you don't have to have that. But the crucial thing is, if you have questions to ask your team members while you're doing these tasks, you can turn on your microphone and ask these questions. Or if you have an idea to share, you can share that idea. And what we tend to find what it, uh, is that the, this is super helpful for junior team members who want on-the-job learning. What's on-the-job learning? It's overwhelmingly asking senior team members questions and having them show you, tell you or show you how to do things. And you can do screen sharing to show how to do things. And that is a very, very helpful technique, very helpful technique because it addresses the on-the-job training needs. It also addresses the team collaboration and integration needs. You know, one of the companies, the Fortune 200 company that I mentioned, the high-tech manufacturing, it provides manufacturing services for semiconductors, semiconductor equipment. So believe me, they grew very quickly during the pandemic. They added about 23% of their workforce during the pandemic. So it's huge. And these people didn't have a way of integrating into the company culture very well. Well, they found that this digital co-working is a very helpful way of integrating these people into the company culture because this way of working together that in, in the academic terminology, scientific terminology, it's called social facilitation, where you're all working together on a shared task and you can ask questions is incredibly helpful for being integrating into the team culture. Another thing that's very helpful for junior team members, which I mean someone who has been on the team for less than three years, is virtual mentorship. So you want to assign each junior team member a mentor from inside the team, one mentor from inside the team, and two from outside the team. A one, it depends on the size of the organization, one from the same business unit and one from a different business unit. So you want people from the team itself to do direct team bonding, team building, team integration, give the unwritten rules and norms of the team to this new person. And from outside the team, that's very helpful for them connecting to the rest of the organization. Because one of the biggest problems is that people don't connect to the rest of the organization during who are junior team members. And this helps address that. Now for virtual innovation, people say that, oh, what's the, you know, we don't have innovation. We need to go get back to the office for innovation. Well, not the case. You can do traditional brainstorming doesn't work well in the office, in the virtual environment, but you can do virtual brainstorming, which means people individually put in their ideas separately. So the first step, it has seven steps. First, people individually separately from each other put their ideas in anonymously into a digital tool like Google Forms that sp spits out a spreadsheet. Everyone looks at the spreadsheet and then you clean it up, remove duplicates, and then you rate each of the remaining ideas and evaluate them. Each person anonymously rates and evaluates them and rating them on their, no, no, on their novelties, how novel they are, how innovative they are, and their practicality, and then evaluates them with a comment with their thoughts on it. Then that's the first three steps. This, then uh, you have another set of idea generation. That's the fourth step based on everyone seeing everyone's comments and ideas 
and you generate revised ideas, then you clean them up, then you evaluate them. And only at that last stage do you do an actual meeting, whether for hybrid teams, you can do this in person, for virtual teams, you can do this remotely, where you discuss which of the ideas should be then implemented going forward. And you have a pretty clear idea on what people think of the different ideas and which seems the most novel slash practical. And so that's a very useful technique. And that is quite helpful. You actually get more novel ideas and more practical ideas than in traditional brainstorming. So very helpful technique. Another technique for innovation is a channel for serendipity. So people miss those hallway conversations where you have you can have those conversations when you run into each other after a meeting or just in the hallway and have ideas that are sparked by them. Well, guess what? You can do the same thing online. People have not tried to do this online. What you need to do instead is create a channel for serendipity online for in your Microsoft team. So just have a channel for serendipitous ideas for each team and also for each business unit for the whole organization if it's a small organization where people can put in the ideas as they occur to them that might be helpful. And then other people, which you know people like to love to give advice, right? They jump in, they suggest well, their improvement on this idea and then it snowballs from there. And then from there, you can go on to the intentional brainstorming. So depending on the situation. But that's a very, very good technique for having serendipitous idea generation. And people love giving advice. and People love having social status by sharing good ideas. And then you want to address diversity, equity, and inclusion concerns. So we, address, we talked a little bit about how diversity, equity, inclusion is already addressed by having more people working remotely, but you also want to address digital discrimination and things like interruptions and privilege in meetings. So for example, people of minority status, especially women, tend to be interrupted much more in meetings and there's still discrimination going on. So you want to make sure to address that. Now, as part of adapting your culture, you want to provide people with training. Provide them with training on effective virtual work, on effective hybrid work, on effective remote work. People are not naturally comfortable with knowing what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. This is completely new. This is a key inflection in the future of work. And people need to be trained on the things that I talked about, on um, that digital co-working, on, that, on the, the virtual innovation, the brainstorming, on these digital discrimination things, on how to communicate effectively virtually and collaborate effectively virtually, on that virtual water cooler. So those are not simple things to learn. People need to change their habits. And that needs to be something that you train people on. So all of these things are trainable, but you need to make sure to train people on them. Now, I'm curious whether you think whether these aspects of adapting your culture to align with a more hybrid remote work style would be valuable for your workplace. Please go ahead and show it. All right, so clearly it would definitely be useful for everyone. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so what are the key takeaways here? Most workers want hybrid, but a large minority want fully remote and they're willing to quit if they don't get their desired work arrangements. Cognitive biases, which we talked about, the status quo bias, functional fixedness, severely impede wise decision-making and risk management on returning to the office. Now, the office return best practice is a team-led hybrid first model with some people fully remote. I need to adapt your culture to seize competitive advantage in the future of work. So that's the key takeaways. And now the, I'll send you some resources after this presentation. You'll get my best-selling book on returning to the office, benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage, and a free coaching session, which is the, I have free, free available for the first free claimants. So you just click on the link and set it up. If it's, the link is available, then you still have it available for you to set up. All right, I'll be happy to take any questions now. You can, we have a small enough group that you can unmute yourself and, or you can put it in the chat, just depends on, of, on whatever you want to, on however you want to do it. Oh, uh, Laura asks which link. I'm not sure what they mean, which link. So I'll just, oh, just send this. the link to the coaching session. This has been really yeah. good. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, you'll yeah. get an you'll get an email. You'll get an email with that, and you'll just click okay. on the link. Happy to. Um, hi, Gleb. It's Keith. I wanted to say first, this was just a very terrific informative session. Um, You're just, welcome. Just terrific. 
But I, I also wanted to mention, you brought up a very interesting point that I had never thought about, about one of the, I, I guess, as opposed to not coming in the office about your career growth, that by not being present, by not being in the yeah. office, there's a chance that you could be um, stunting. And I, I thought that was an excellent point and it was something I never considered. Yeah, so there's there's different research on that, and also from my experience in companies that I helped adapt to, you need to train people who are fully remote on how to advocate for themselves, and that's something that they can be trained on, but they need to be trained on this, and managers need to be trained on not leaving them behind. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself or you can drop them in the chat. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, uh, thank you again for your presentation. Um, it was um, very informative, um, and um, we um, can definitely um, share your resources after the fact. Um, we'll send a follow-up email to yes. everyone that attended. Um, um, but um, I think that's all we have for um, today. Excellent. Well, uh, everyone, look for the email and. Laura, definitely schedule the coaching session. Everyone else who wants to as well can ask any questions there. All right, everyone. You have a great day. Thanks very Bye. much. Thank you too. Take care, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.